Welcome everybody to the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And we were so excited here today to introduce you to Cassie, the most wonderful author of this exciting new book. I'm so, oh. Oh, there you're just, just <laughs> just in your background, sorry. Don't, don't move too slowly, don't move too fast. <laughs> so she wrote this amazing book and she's done all this research and everything. And so we really wanted to introduce you to her and give you a chance to hear some of the stories in the book because this is about right here in San Jose. So Cassie, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. As we get going, folks, if you wanna put questions in the chat channel, I'll keep my eye on that. And we can answer those um, whenever you feel comfortable, Cassie, if you wanna wait till the end or if you feel like answering them um, at the end of each story or okay. however you wanna do. Okay. Let's for now, let's hold them until the end. I think we'll have time at the end uh, to get okay. everything. So. Um, Cool. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Are folks seeing my screen? There we go. Great. Cool. Well, uh, thank you, Terry, uh, so much for the introduction and for the invitation uh, to speak here tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and very grateful for the work that the Open Space Authority does uh, to protect nature in and around our uh, community. So um, I'm here to share some stories uh, from my book, A Secret San Jose, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure. Um, it uh, just came out about three weeks ago, uh, and it's available now on my website, uh, secretsanjose.com, uh, at local bookstores, including Hickleby's in Willow Glen, uh, Books, Inc. in Campbell, uh, and also on Amazon. So uh, Secret San Jose uh, is an unconventional travel guidebook uh, featuring more than 85 unique stories about our community uh, places to visit and things to do. Uh, in addition to some quirky and unusual stories, the weird, um, I tried to share stories that document how San Jose came to be and highlight the contributions of people and organizations uh, that aren't usually recognized here in our community. Um, I've known Terry and the folks here at the Open Space Authority uh, here for a while. Um, I've worked on contract with the agency uh, for the last uh, few years, helping with communications projects and writing articles uh, for the authority's website and email newsletter. Uh, a number of the stories uh, that I wound up including in this book actually came out of things uh, that I researched for the authority uh, or um, ideas that I learned about, things that I learned about at their events. Uh, many of the stories in here uh, that are about our natural environment, uh, wildlife, ecology, ranching, and local agriculture um, are rooted in the authority's work. Uh, so if you're new to this wonderful agency um, and you aren't already on their email list, uh, please do sign up. Uh, they host fabulous uh, virtual events uh, like uh, this one right now. I hope it's good. <laughs> and uh, once it's deemed safe, uh, they'll be resuming their guided outdoor hikes and volunteer programs. So um, when I took on the project uh, to write Secret San Jose, I could not have expected uh, the world uh, that this book would launch into uh, with the pandemic, California's worst fire season ever, and everything else that's going on. Uh, but frankly, the book couldn't have come out at a better time. Uh, a lot of the stories in here are pegged to places that you can visit and appreciate safely outdoors, six feet apart. Uh, and in the midst of this very challenging year, uh, with all of us staying home uh, a bit more than usual, uh, it's a great time to learn about and appreciate our local community, uh, especially our many local parks and open spaces. Uh, so that said, um, I picked six stories from the book uh, to share with you tonight, uh, each centered on the history of a different local park or preserve uh, and all conservation based. Uh, coincidentally, all six of these places are managed by different public park agencies. Um, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things about living here in the South Bay is that we have so many different parks, trails, and open spaces here, and they're all truly local gems. So uh, the first story I wanted to share is called On the Trail, which Nas U.S. National Park site is right outside of San Jose. Uh, so does anyone here know, uh, Terry, maybe you can check in the questions, um, who knows what national park site is right here in the South Bay? Feel like I should hum Jeopardy. <laughs> you should. Does anyone know? Uh, does anyone know? Did anyone share anything? I can't actually see the. Somebody oh, said Pinnacles. Is it Yosemite? No, not Pinnacles. Not Yosemite. It's a little closer. A lot closer. Anyone? Oop. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Cool. Good. So this is a surprise. Um. So. Uh, the Arrowhead Trail at Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve 
uh, is an official, official interpretive site uh, for the Juan Bautista de Anza National Historic Trail. Uh, this 1,200 mile federally designated route uh, stretches from Nogales, Arizona uh, to the San Francisco Bay. And it marks the path uh, traveled by Spanish officer Juan Bautista de Anza uh, to build the first non-native settlements in Northern California. Uh, this momentous journey uh, led to the founding of the Pueblo uh, of San Jose, uh, the California's first city, uh, the Presidio of San Francisco, and the Catholic missions in San Francisco, Santa Clara, and Fremont. So over the course of eight months, uh, from the fall of 1775 uh, to the spring of 1776, uh, Anza led 240 settlers and more than 1,000 head of cattle uh, across the deserts on foot and on horseback. Uh, the group was said to be one mile long and three miles, um, or one mile wide and three miles long. Every night, every single night, uh, they set up camp and the next morning packed it all in uh, to head out on the path all over again. Uh, one thing to note here was that more than a third of this group were small children. <laughs> we are in a pandemic. A lot of families here um, on this uh, event tonight have probably been doing some road trips. Uh, can you imagine traveling for eight months uh, with your small kids in a van and the comforts of rest stop and hotel rooms, uh, uh, camping somewhere, or packing up, staying in a new hotel every single night? Um, that sounds hard to imagine. <laughs> now imagine doing that trek on horseback through a desert in the heat of um, the desert sun, even while pregnant. Um, there was only one death in route on this long trek. Um, Maria Pinuelas uh, died from complications during childbirth. childbirth. Um, luckily, she delivered the baby just fine. He survived, um, but um, uh, she did not. Um, I'm going back to this photo or this slide because it was a pretty photo. <laughs> uh, this group was an ethnically diverse mix of Native American, European, and African heritage. It included some of the earliest settlers to San Jose, including Manuel Gonzalez, an Apache Indian who served as the second mayor of San Jose. Uh, if you guys are familiar with what's often called uh, the Peralta Adobe in downtown San Jose on the grounds of the San Pedro Square Market, uh, that adobe house, uh, which is San Jose's oldest building, uh, was actually built by Manuel Gonzalez in 1797. Uh, Peralta uh, bought the building from Gonzalez um, afterwards. Uh, History San Jose, the organization who, that owns that property right now, is now calling it the Peralta Gonzalez Adobe uh, to recognize the pioneer uh, who built it. So um, after the group arrived, uh, they made this long trek and arrived in the existing military presidio at Monterey. Uh, most of the settlers camped there um, while Anza and a small group of officers and priests carried on towards San Francisco uh, to identify places for this uh, new Northern California military encampment, uh, the new missions and residential settlements, including San Jose. On March 24th, 1776, uh, the group hiked into the Coyote Valley uh, just south of San Jose and set up camp on the banks of uh, Yagas Creek in what's now the city of Morgan Hill. Uh, so their very first view of what would become San Jose, uh, the 10th biggest city in the US, uh, was along this path that stretched north through the Coyote Valley, um, looking uh, a little bit similar <laughs> to what we see uh, right here. Um, as no land uh, from Anza's actual path is now publicly owned. Um, in 2015, the US National Park Service certified nearby Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve as an interpretive educational site uh, for the Juan Bautista de Anza National Historic Trail. Uh, so visitors uh, hiking uh, the preserve's 4.1 mile Arrowhead Trail uh, can now go there and see signage uh, telling the story of this journey. Um, see protected landscapes full of um, native plants and wildlife, and broad views of the valley that Anza and his team traveled through. Um, these photos here were taken on one of the Anza Trail history hikes that the Open Space Authority used to organize regularly pre-pandemic. Uh, the docent pictured up in the uh, left corner here, uh, Les Kramer, uh, who guides uh, those hikes, actually helped to get the property certified as part of the National Park Service's Anza Trail. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's here tonight, but if he is, uh, thank you, Les, uh, so much for your work on this. 
Finally, um, if you want to go see the spot where the Anza party actually camped that first night in the Coyote Valley, uh, there's a marker uh, for that, nine miles south of uh, the Coyote Valley Preserve uh, along Yalgus Creek. Uh, this is on private property, uh, but it is publicly accessible. Uh, it's next to and part of the Woodland Estates Mobile Home Park uh, in Santa Teresa Boulevard. Uh, so to go uh, see the spot, you can park near the Mobile Home Communities Clubhouse and then hike west along the creek until you reach the monument at the trail's end. So if you want to see the actual spot where they camped, um, it's this little parcel here right along the, um, this mobile home park. So uh, the second story I wanted to share um, with you folks tonight uh, was called Crisis Averted. Uh, when was San Jose close to joining the Confederacy? So uh, when you think of the Civil War, uh, you don't typically think of California. We were over here on our own, uh, dealing with our own challenges of growing communities in the Wild West. Uh, but there was one short time uh, where there was almost a battle for secession right here in San Jose. So you might be familiar with the new Almaden mines, if you've ever been up to Almaden Quicksilver uh, County Park. Uh, this was at one point, and you can see a photo of it up in the upper left or right corner here. Uh, at one point, this was the largest quicksilver or mercury mine in the United States. Uh, quicksilver was used to separate gold or silver from crushed ore. So the success of California's gold rush um, was actually due in large part uh, to the abundance of quicksilver supplied by the mines uh, right here at New Almaden. Uh, this was an incredibly valuable operation. Uh, the value of mercury produced here uh, was actually greater than that of any other single gold mine in California. Uh, so um, yeah, this quicksilver was so valuable. Um, the New Almaden Quicksilver Mining Company uh, had been founded in 1845 uh, by a Mexican lieutenant uh, when California was part of Mexico um, and sold in 1850 uh, to a Mexican mine operator. Uh, after California joined the Union the same year, uh, the U.S. government, swayed by East Coast mining interests, particularly the Quicksilver Mining Company of New York, uh, which owned mines near New Almaden, uh, argued that the land claim was based on fraudulent documents and that the land should revert to the U.S. government. Uh, this claim was even upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. Curiously, uh, several Lincoln administration officials held stock in that uh, U New York mining company. Uh, so they clearly had no ulter ulterior motives here. Uh, so that brings us to this guy. Uh, <laughs> on uh, May 8, 1863, uh, President Lincoln authorized an agent to come to San Jose and take possession of the land for the United States. Uh, U.S. military forces were engaged uh, just in case they would have to take the land by force. On July 9th, uh, Lincoln's agent traveled to the New Almaden mine and demanded that the mine manager turn the land over to the U.S. government. Uh, the mine manager refused. But word of this attempt uh, to take control of the mine spread through the communities of miners in both California and Nevada who feared that this would lead to other takeovers and that they would lose their jobs. Uh, newspapers showed cartoons of miners in protest, holding signs saying, Lincoln, you won't take our mines. Stay out of New Almaden. Uh, you can see that here in orange. Uh, for some context here, uh, while California was officially part of the Union and technically a free state, 10% of the population was thought to support uh, Confederate causes at the time, including slavery. Some Southerners actually brought their slaves with them to California uh, to work on farms or in mines. Uh, in the 1852 census, there were actually eight people here in Santa Clara County uh, that had their occupation listed as slave. So um, Southern political sympathizers used this land rights dispute uh, to exploit the miners' fears of the US government and turn them away from the union. Um, there's this other cartoon uh, up here in the corner, the upper left corner, uh, depicting the Copperhead Party, uh, which were Southern political sympathizers and a growing force at the time in California. Uh, they were shown as Copperhead snakes, ready to strike against the Union government. So Lincoln's officials in San Francisco uh, warned the president that an armed uprising at New Almaden was likely and could have broader uh, political implications of spreading Confederate support across the West if he moved forward with plans to take the mines here. 
Luckily, Lincoln uh, took the advice of his colleagues on the ground in California and decided to back off and issued an apology, uh, leaving companies to resolve uh, these issues on their own. Uh, ultimately, the New Almaden Company wound up selling the property to the Quicksilver Mining Company anyway. Uh, but despite that, uh, Lincoln maintained the support he needed and won the votes of a majority of California voters in his re-election the following year. So today, uh, to learn more about this and other stories of these mines, uh, you can go to the New Almaden Quicksilver Mining Museum, uh, which is operated by the Santa Clara County Park System. I don't think uh, the museum itself um, indoors is open to the public just yet, uh, but you can definitely go down there onto um, the old village of New Almaden uh, to explore uh, the outside. Uh, there are lots of uh, 19th century mine era houses still there, including the museum building uh, called uh, Casa Grande, uh, which served as the mine manager's residence. Uh, you can see that building uh, pictured here to the left. Uh, this house was actually built in 1854, and it's the second oldest house in Santa Clara County uh, after the uh, Peralta Gonzalez adobe that I mentioned before. Um, people are always asking me about ghost stories, and uh, there's a good one here. Uh, Casa Grande is apparently haunted by um, the deceased child of one of uh, the mine managers. Uh, Terry here <laughs> actually told me that story. Uh, she knows county park rangers uh, that have experienced really strange things uh, while working late at night there. So maybe she'll share uh, more of that story later on. <laughs> uh, but also, um, you can hike around Almaden Quicksilver County Park uh, and see the remnants of this old ghost town. At one point, there were actually 4,000 miners and their families living in a variety of ethnic and linguistic-based mining camps in these hills. And you can see some of the last remaining buildings um, in these communities along the trail. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, the county did history hikes up here, which is when I took all of the photos here. Uh, but there are a lot of interpretive uh, signage along the trails. Uh, so you can uh, just head up there and uh, do a hike on your own and learn a lot about this uh, community. I'm sure the County Parks Department is also doing some virtual events um, to share this history. Uh, so look on the County Parks website and look for events um, uh, focused around uh, Almaden Quicksilver County Park. And then finally, because Halloween is coming up, ooh, <laughs> I see Terry's face. Um, when you go to the village of New Almaden, uh, you'll wanna check out uh, the community's tiny Hacienda Cemetery. Here you'll find Santa Clara County's strangest grave, uh, the grave for a dismembered arm. Um, Bert Barrett was an 11 year old boy who lived in the community uh, and shot off his arm in a hunting accident. Uh, apparently, at the time, uh, there was a law that required dismembered limbs to be buried. Uh, so they buried his arm here, though he survived and lived another 61 years. Uh, the rest of his body was buried at the time of his death at San Jose Oak Hill Cemetery. Uh, so you can go and you can see the gravestone uh, that says, Bert Barrett, his arm lies here. May it rest in peace. <laughs> But locals say uh, that each year on Halloween night, which is coming up, uh, Barrett's arm comes alive, uh, rises out of the tomb, and tries to reunite with the rest of his body. Uh, so keep a lookout for Bert Barrett's ghost arm this year. And the next story I wanted to share is called uh, Springs Eternal. Uh, what popular park used to be a famous and nationally known health spa? Uh, so who knows here what we're talking about? Um, if you know which, uh, which park I'm talking about here, uh, put it in chat. Terry, can you let me know if anyone... Uh... Somebody said, Alan Rock! Alan Rock, okay. Alan Rock. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> Yay! Great, so yes, well, we're talking about Alan Rock Park. Um, this is the oldest and largest park in the city of San Jose. Uh, though today's wild hiking trails and undisturbed access to nature are very different draws uh, from what the park offered visitors um, about 100 years ago. Alum Rock Park was designated as a public park by the California State Legislature in 1872 and uh, credited as being the first city park in all of California. Uh, for just 25 cents, uh, you could hop on a steam train and later an electric streetcar in downtown San Jose and uh, take it all the way into the park, um, where as many as 10,000 visitors uh, would gather on a single Sunday afternoon. I found some of these old postcards uh, showing some of the park's uh, main attractions. An aviary, uh, you can see up in the left corner there, a Japanese tea house uh, just below it, 
uh, and off to the right, um, a 2,000 ton black rock that they claim to be one of the largest meteorites in the world. Uh, so, so this was on postcards and people would always share this. Um, it was a good selfie spot, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> but people would come in crowds all dressed up to, uh, to see people and be seen in the park here. But the biggest draw uh, was the famous mineral springs. Uh, people would travel from all around the country uh, to soak in various hot and cold pools of mineral water uh, that 19th century doctors claimed were good for various ailments. Uh, from 1891 on, the city built a bandstand, a restaurant, ornate stone grottos, bathhouses, and a large indoor swimming pool with a two-story slide uh, called the natatorium. Uh, you can see that up in the upper right uh, corner here, as well as the um, lower uh, right. Uh, this place was crowded and more like an amusement park um, than what we consider parks um, to be today. Unfortunately, uh, because of the heavy visitor traffic and all this development, uh, over the years, uh, the native plants and wildlife uh, population here declined dramatically in the park. In the 1970s, uh, the city decided to return the park to a more natural state, uh, removing the swimming pool, many of the buildings, and closing off some areas. So as the natural habitat recovered, uh, many species of native wildlife and plants returned, and the park is now a popular destination for school groups. Uh, the environmental education nonprofit Youth Science Institute is based on site, uh, organizing programs that teach kids about nature. It's a popular city park, uh, but peaceful and a world away from the circus-like environment uh, that locals um, got uh, 100 years ago. But today, um, you can still see the ruins uh, of the old stone grottos and smell the sulfur springs along the Penitentia Creek and Mineral Springs Loop Trails. Uh, the park facilities building and now stands on the site of the uh, old natatorium, the swimming pool, and the adjacent public restrooms were once part of the original pool house. Uh, so you can still see some uh, signs of the parks, not so distant past. So the next story um, I wanted to share is called Drowned Town. Uh, when was there a town on stilts hovering over the San Francisco Bay? So um, if you're riding the Amtrak uh, or the ACE uh, commuter trains from San Jose to Oakland, uh, you might notice some old buildings sinking into the salt marsh along the bay just south of Fremont. Uh, these structures are the last remaining signs of the old ghost town drawbridge. Uh, I took this terrible fuzzy photo a few years ago on the Amtrak. It was moving fast. <laughs> uh, you can see um, down here in the lower corner, the lower right corner, um, there's a map there uh, from the Mercury News um, that shows exactly where Drawbridge is uh, in between Milpitas and Fremont uh, along uh, the train tracks there. So for almost 100 years, uh, the town was a weekend getaway destination uh, for folks from all over the Bay. Um, mostly duck hunters, fishermen, and sun-seeking San Franciscans. At its peak, uh, the town had 90 uh, cabins, hotels, and saloons, all perched on stilts uh, to raise them out of the marshy ground. Um, this whole environment uh, was wetlands, uh, so uh, in order to build anything, uh, you had to put them up on stilts and uh, raised uh, uh, wooden platforms, uh, like you're seeing uh, these boardwalks uh, here. Uh, but it was a really popular place. Um, on some weekends, the small community had as many as 600 local visitors. Uh, the town was known to be a relatively lawless and rowdy place. Um, they never had a regular police or county sheriff presence, and uh, prostitution, gambling, and alcohol uh, were all easy to find, even during Prohibition. So the town was actually a railroad stop on the train between uh, Oakland and Santa Cruz. Uh, several ran through the area every day, uh, so it was an easy local getaway from uh, anywhere. By the 20th century, uh, drawbridge had started to decline uh, for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, hunters had decimated the local bird population. Um, while I'm sure there were some hunters uh, that were moderate in what they took, uh, like these guys, I assume, shooting uh, the ducks one at a time for sport, uh, there were all others that would use another more destructive method. Uh, they would bring out a cannon, fill it with gunpowder, chains, and nails, and shoot it off into a flock of birds. And this would kill 500 to 1,000 birds um, with a single shot. Unfortunately, this method was not sustainable for the local duck population. Second, uh, the San Francisco Bay was becoming increasingly polluted uh, with raw sewage, causing the fish population to decline. 
Uh, this was back before we had a municipal sewage treatment plant and both urban and agricultural waste uh, was pumped right out into the bay. Finally, uh, the town started to sink as a Bayfront Salt Company started to build levees and drain the natural wetlands in this area. So over the, the years, over the period of several decades, uh, humans were decimating this natural environment um, and access, the access to wildlife um, that had brought people to the town originally uh, became less of a draw and tourism started to wane. A population declined from the 1940s on and the last full-time resident uh, moved out of Drawbridge in 1979. Today, uh, the land where Drawbridge once stood is a protected habitat owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and managed as part of the Don Edwards San Francisco National, um, San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the last remaining structures on the site are decomposing and sinking into the marshland. Um, there's no public access uh, allowed to this highly fragile protected environment. Uh, it's illegal to hike down here and visit it on your own. Uh, trespassers, trespassers are penalized uh, with large fines. But it's been a tremendous conservation success story. As the um, Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies have uh, worked to restore the native salt marsh habitat along the bay and let this uh, area go back to nature, uh, the populations of several native and threatened wildlife species have started to rebound, including the salt marsh harvest mouse, uh, which is endangered, only found here in the Bay Area. Now you can see a picture of that mouse uh, here in the middle and a bird called the Ridgeways Rail, um, both pictured here. Uh, while you can't visit yourself, I did want to share some photos um, that are really uh, wonderful. Uh, they were taken by a local photographer named uh, Cole Benton. Sorry, let me get back up to the top. Uh, who had a legal permit from the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to go down and fly a drone over the drawbridge area. Um, I think this is part of a multi-year uh, program uh, to document the habitat restoration work that's happening here. Uh, so you can see here um, some really gorgeous photos uh, of this environment. Um, you can see right here, for example, uh, this one right here, you can see the buildings, um, uh, the last remaining buildings of the town of Drawbridge along the rail tracks right here, uh, as well as all of um, this beautiful habitat um, that's restoring to nature along the bay. Um, they're really wonderful shapes and colors, and uh, I'm so glad that they're protecting this space and uh, returning it to nature. So let me go back to here. Um, yeah, so as climate change causes uh, bay waters uh, to rise, uh, those last signs of drawbridge will continue to disappear. Uh, so hop on a train and spot the buildings now while you can. And definitely visit the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge uh, to see these environments up close and learn more about the native plants and animals uh, that live alongside us here in the Bay. Uh, so the next story I wanted to share is called Ancient Giants. Uh, how did pioneering environmentalists fight to save California's redwood forests? So I wanted to start here uh, by sharing a quote that I found uh, by a woman named Carrie Stevens Walter. Uh, this is in 1901. Uh, uh, Carrie was a member of the San Jose Women's Club, uh, a poet and educator, and uh, one of our early um, environmental activists here in our community. Uh, her quote starts, imagine a time when the whole peninsula from San Francisco to San Jose shall become one great city. Uh, for any of you that have driven the 101 up to San Francisco, it's not actually hard uh, to imagine that. Um, that's what we're living in today. And she continued, uh, then picture at its very doorstep, this magnificent domain of redwood forests and running streams, the breathing place of millions of cramped and crowded denizens of the city. Uh, Walter was talking, of course, about our local redwood forests uh, here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, at the time, uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains were a really wild place. Uh, they were filled with a seemingly endless number of giant coast redwood trees. And just a few decades before, California grizzly bears, which are now extinct. It's estimated that there were once uh, more than 10,000 grizzly bears roaming all across the state of California. Uh, the last grizzly ever spotted uh, here in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, was killed in 1885 near the town of Bonnie Doon. Uh, one reason for the decline, no doubt, uh, were the gruesome bear versus bull fights that were popular entertainment in 19th century California. 
You can see that depicted in this image uh, to the right. Every Sunday afternoon uh, here in San Jose, the spectators could go down to St. James Park in downtown and place bets as these giant animals were pitted against each other to the deck. Anyway, back to Carrie Walter. In the late 1800s, she was horrified uh, to see loggers chopping down these ancient giant trees and uh, leaving bare hills behind. So Walter, uh, pictured here in the lower right corner of this slide, uh, she joined a, a group of other concerned neighbors led by a noted painter and photographer, Andrew P. Hill, uh, to protect the remaining old, go old growth coast redwoods here. Uh, Andrew Hill is the guy here in the upper right corner. Uh, the guy with a really good pandemic beard, I should point out. <laughs> it is really long. <laughs> um, so Walters and Hill co-founded the Semper Viens Club, uh, which still exists today. Uh, and they fought to spread the word about uh, these re remaining giant trees uh, here in our forest. Thank to the, thanks to this organization's lobbying efforts, uh, California state, legislator, the state legislature uh, passed a bill in 1901 that officially designated Big Basin Redwoods as California's first state park, uh, protecting these remaining giants forever. Up until earlier this year, uh, you could stand in awe of Big Basin's ancient and massive trees, uh, some as old as 1800 years old and as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the park offers visitors 80 miles of hiking trails, hidden waterfalls in the winter, and stunning views of the Pacific Ocean. As one of the, quote, millions of cramped and crowded denizens of the city, end quote, uh, that Walter uh, herself imagined back in this quote, I'm really grateful uh, for their work to protect this special place. But as we know, unfortunately, uh, this summer, uh, Big Basin Redwoods State Park uh, was hit by the CZU uh, complex wildfire, one of California's biggest and most destructive wildfires ever. Uh, this news is devastating for all of us that love this forest. An estimate from POST, uh, the Peninsula Open Space Trust, said that more than 40% of the redwood trees in the Santa Cruz Mountains burned, including Big Basin's grove of ancient giants. It'll be months, if not years, uh, before scientists fully understand the impact these fires have had on the forest here. Uh, but a quote from Walter Moore, uh, president of POST, um, gives me some hope for the future. Quote, as you may already know, fire in this landscape can be healthy and beneficial for the redwood forest, as it is very well adapted to survive fire. In fact, fire is an integral part of this environment and helps to maintain the health of the ecosystem. Redwood trees, especially old growth, can withstand fire, and early indications are that many have survived. Uh, so that's really good news to hear. Uh, there's some other bright spots. Uh, the fire burned cooler and with less intensity in some areas than others. Uh, so some trees uh, were less affected. Uh, those areas are going to rebound with new plant growth sooner. Land conservation organizations across the state, uh, including our host here tonight, the Open Space Authority, uh, will be using the lessons the scientists are learning uh, from this tragic California fire season uh, to build more fire resistant, uh, fire resilient habitats in the future. Uh, so the last story I wanted to share tonight uh, is called A Heavenly Sight. Where can you see from Monterey Bay to the Sierras? So one of the best vistas over the Santa Clara Valley has a very long history uh, from an indigenous sacred space uh, to the US military during the Cold War uh, to now, uh, where it's a public open space. So Mount Umanum, I don't know if I'm saying that right. <laughs> I always say it wrong. <laughs> I always say it wrong. Mount Umanum, uh, in the hills east of Los Gatos, uh, was traditionally a spiritual center uh, for the Amamutsan and Muwekma indigenous communities, uh, the modern descendants of the South Bay's first people. Later, the sacred space was occupied by the US government and used as an Air Force base and Cold War era radar tower. Uh, today, this land is managed by the Mid-Peninsula Open Space District, and it's part of the 18,000-acre Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve. The name Umunum uh, means resting place of the hummingbird in five different dialects of the Ohlone uh, tribal languages. And the hummingbird plays an important role in the creation story of these native tribal bands. Migratory hummingbirds uh, do actually come up to this peak, uh, so you will see hummingbirds here. 
Uh, Mount, Mount Um uh, is one of the four highest peaks in the Bay Area, uh, along with Mount Hamilton, Mount Diablo, and Mount Tamalpais, or Mount Tam. On a clear day at the summit, uh, you can see from the Monterey Peninsula over to the Sierra Nevada. Uh, the hiking trails up here are part of the Bay Area Ridge Trail, um, which um, up in the right corner, you can see uh, an image of one of the trail signs here. Uh, if you haven't heard of this project, um, it's a tremendous local effort to connect the mountain ridges uh, through all 10 Bay Area counties into one continuous 550 mile park. Uh, Mount Um is actually the highest peak on the whole ridge trail, uh, as you can see from that sign there. During the Cold War, uh, the US uh, Air Force decided that this peak would be a strategic place to watch for Russian bombers. Uh, so they stationed soldiers there to scan the skies. The Almaden Air Force Station had residences for officers and families living on site, including a swimming pool and two lane bowling alley for them. <laughs> Um, when satellites made this manual scanning um, of, of these soldiers uh, obsolete, uh, the Air Force decommissioned the base. Uh, the Mid-Peninsula Open Space District later acquired it and worked with the federal government to do cleanup and restoration here at this mountain peak. Uh, while they demolished most of the original buildings, uh, they maintained the I iconic 85-foot tall tower, uh, which stands like a beacon over the Santa Clara Valley. Uh, the agency is currently working to shore up uh, this crumbling uh, landmark tower and to keep visitors safe. Uh, they've recontoured uh, the once leveled peak uh, to try to resemble the mountain's original shape. Uh, they've also continued to work to re-establish native plants, uh, which are helping to bring back native wildlife onto this area. Uh, the mountain peak reopened to the public as a protected open space in 2017. And if you haven't been there, um, definitely uh, drive up to see it. It's a beautiful place. Finally, and importantly, uh, this mountain is again public and accessible uh, to the local indigenous community. As part of the restoration efforts here, uh, the district worked with the Amamutsin uh, tribal band uh, to design a ceremonial circle uh, where local indigenous people uh, can once again dance and engage with this sacred space. Uh, members of the community uh, hadn't had this opportunity to do this for more than 100 years. Uh, so with that said, uh, thank you all again for your time, uh, for joining us tonight, um, and thank you to the Open Space Authority uh, for having me. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, if you'd like to go ahead and, and uh, um, stop sharing your screen, and, sure. then, and then folks can look. Yes, and definitely. So, uh, so we did have a couple hands that were raised. Let's see. Great. So, Rose, um, Rose, I'm going to allow you, I'm going to un allow you to talk you can unmute you so if you want to go ahead and um, unmute yourself and then you can ask Cassie your question uh, my question is already in the chat in terms of uh, the very first one that she mentioned is a national park so mm -hmm. is, is it officially listed as a national park it's not a national park uh, it's a National Historic Trail um, that the, oh, national okay. park, yeah, the National Park Service um, manages and designated um, these, um, there's a number of them, there's like 15 trails of historic importance uh, of settlement and uh, exploration uh, across the United States. And the National Park Service designates these places, um, but, it, but in this case, uh, the Open Space Authority here, our host, uh, manages the land, uh, but it is, it's been recognized by the National Park, uh, and it is uh, you know, technically a, a national park site. Uh, so the National Park Service has um, several hundred, I think over 500 national park sites that are not actually national parks. Um, there are a lot of different designations, including this uh, National Historic Trail, National Wildlife Refuges that we talked about. Um, um, yeah, no, they're uh, just different designations. Um, so. so do they have their own parking or people have to park by the uh, uh, mobile park home uh, area that you mentioned? Oh, for the mobile home park that I mentioned. Um, again, that site, um, that is a historic site, um, but it is, it is on private property. Uh, but you are able to drive into this mobile home park. Um, I, I think it's, um, I, I believe it's open to the public. Um, just be quiet and respectful. There are people that live there. Uh, you can park at the mobile home communities clubhouse and uh, you can walk along. There's a trail. There's a marked trail that goes along the waterfront um, or along the, the creek. 
uh, and you can hike along uh, to um, that uh, monument at the very end of the trail, uh, which is where the Anza Party uh, camped. So if you're down in uh, Morgan Hill, um, definitely drive by. Our next speaker is uh, Kathleen. So Kathleen Jarvis, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Kathleen. It looks like you're still muted, Kathleen. I wonder if I can. Oh yeah, are we able to? There, we go. Oh, there we go. Aha. <laughs> I can't see myself. That's okay. That's our safety measures for like all of you so you don't get startled by anybody who might be rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you, you mean you trust me not to be, huh? <laughs> well, I was over warming up a cloth to put on my cheek next to my sore tooth, so I missed your question. <laughs> About ask me questions or something? Oh, yeah, so I noticed that you had your hand raised, and I wondered if you had a question. Oh, um, oh no, no, no. Um, I, maybe I would. Oh, it might be an accident. I want to say hello, and it was just still there. <laughs> <laughs> if you think of something, just let us know. Yeah. And then the next person I'll get is Paul. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hi. Hi, Paul. Uh, good to see you. Great presentation, uh, but I'm really sorry. I have to correct something you said. I'll first, I'll give you a chance to correct it. You stated the Big Basin Redwoods is California's first state park. Do you want to correct that, or you want me to? Is this a trick question? California's first state park. Um, no. Feel free to feel free to share. I'm okay, California's first state park was Yosemite, but they gave it back to the federal government. Oh, Our oldest continuous state park yeah. is Big Basin. Oh, interesting. Oh, that is a good, that is a trick question. I didn't realize that oh. Yosemite was actually designated by the state as a protected space before it was a national park. Yes, we gave awesome. it back to the feds. <laughs> awesome, great, great. Thank you for pointing that out. That's awesome. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Jeopardy, Jeopardy. <laughs> so we have Ian. Ian, I'll... Uh, I'll I'll let you in here. So go ahead and unmute yourself. You have a question? Ian! <laughs> Hi, Ian. It looks like you're unmuted now. Some folks do have earbuds. Um, so if oh. you have an earbud plugged in, sometimes we've noticed recently this week that some of the earbuds will mute you by accident. So if you want to um, pull the earbuds out, if, if that's what you have, and then and then we'll be able to hear you. Suspense. Can you hear us, Ian? Oh, okay. So I think what we'll do then is we'll go to Craig Edgerton. Ian, if you if you get a chance and you want to type your question into the chat, we can answer it that way too. Okay. Cool. Go ahead, Craig. Hi, Craig. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Nice presentation. Uh, I knew most of those stories, but just just enough to get it all wrong. So you straightened <laughs> out a lot of it for me. And I look forward to getting your book. Where can we get it? Yes, uh, absolutely. So um, my book is available I'm at my website, uh, which is secretsanjose.com. Uh, I'm signing it and I'm donating a portion of uh, proceeds uh, through my website uh, to uh, Second Harvest, our local food bank, uh, through the uh, end of the pandemic. Uh, so that's a good place to, to do it. Um, and, uh, I'll be signing them. And um, in most cases, if you live here in San Jose, I'll be delivering it to you like I did Terry's last week. <laughs> I'm trying to deliver them uh, as much as I can just because it's, it's the fastest way to get them into your hands. Uh, but I also okay. definitely Bye. recommend um, going to any of our local bookstores, our local independent bookstores. Um, Secret San Jose is definitely at Hickleby's in Willow Glen uh, and uh, Books Inc. in Campbell. Uh, and I haven't checked um, any, uh, I haven't checked some of the other bookstores, but uh, definitely support our local independent bookstores right now. They really need it. Uh, so if you want to go uh, buy it there, um, yeah, then send me an email. I'm happy to sign it <laughs> another time. But uh, yeah, buy it, buy it from our local bookstores or, or me. That's, those are the best places. It's also available. Okay, on so, my, so my question is, yeah. are you familiar with Mexican General Mitchell Torreno's invasion of San, San Jose in 1847? Is that something you've ever heard about or researched? 
think I heard about that. There was a very short, um, is, is that, did it, did it actually happen in Santa Clara? It happened in Coyote Valley, uh, just below where the Metcalf Energy Center is right now. Uh, okay. It's sometimes, some people refer to it as California's Alamo, but it's a very much reduced version of it. I tell that story when I'm out on the Arrowhead Trail uh, leading things, but, but I only found a little bit of information and there's, I, I've really, I've researched as much as I can. I didn't know if you had some information about that. No, I don't. I haven't heard this story before. What was his name again? The general's name? Mitchell Terreno. It's one word. M I C H E L T O R. It's in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, and the uh, some of the local uh, Californios they were known as uh, got mm -hmm. a militia together and they had a standoff uh, right near the Metcalf Energy Center. Really? Anyway, oh, yeah. Really? I, I may contact you and see how I could go about getting more on that story because. I think it'd be an interesting story to tell at uh, when we're at the uh, Open Space Reserve or at the new uh, uh, Coyote uh, uh, Valley. North Coyote um, oh, the, Conservation. Yeah, the new one. What's, I, I can't remember. <laughs> now you have to come to the meeting so you can be involved with the, you know, the development of that. <laughs> Change the name if you want. Yeah. So anyway, that, that'd be a good story to tell and have a little thing out there once we can verify a lot of the information. So I may contact you about that. Thanks. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And actually, um, Terry, can you check in the chat or let me see if I can do it. Um, Ron Horry, I just shared, um, oh. I think that was called the Battle of Santa Teresa, which I have heard of. Oh. Um, and someone, Mike um, Boulevard uh, knows, if I'm saying his name right, uh, knows better. Yeah, Mike Boland. Yeah. Mike Boland. Okay, cool. Oh, so Ian put his question in the chat. So okay. he says, microphone isn't, isn't functioning, but he says, my question was related to the old growth redwoods. Yes. Is it the case that they, were, that they are new growth redwoods? That is a good question. I don't know a lot about um, um, what has come out, the science um, of what has come out um, in these last um, six weeks or however long it's been uh, since this all happened. Um, it is possible, I think I have heard that younger trees don't fare as well. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, but younger trees are less resistant uh, to wildfires than some of the older trees. So because we cut down a lot of the old growth forests uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, except for uh, some of these um, some of these protected uh, groves, um, it could be that uh, there's more uh, destruction actually in the newer areas. Um, but um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm speculating on that here. I think I, I feel like I did hear something like over the years as these trees get bigger and have more and more layers um, of um, uh, layers on the outside um, that protect them, um, that they can withstand fire um, even better. So where ancient trees may be in better shape, actually, than um, some younger trees. So one thing I'd like to do really quick before I forget, short attention span because all these great stories. <laughs> so uh, Saved by Nature is also a fan. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and so we, we would like I'm a to, fan of them. <laughs> and Saved by Nature would like to um, sponsor basically four books um, to be handed out right now. Yay. Winners. So uh, Cassie, if you could pick a number between one and 47. One and 47. Um, 30, 32. 32. Okay. Pick another one. 16. 16. One more. Um, 27. 27. And one more. 40. 40. Okay. This is the part where I start counting. One, two, three. <laughs> you don't have to do that on the spot here, Terry. Uh, but yeah, so whoever, <laughs> whoever joined in those number in that numeric order. <laughs> cool. So, do we have, um, oh, do, do, Terry, well, you, you are doing Jeannie it. Jeannie Palmer. What's that? Jeannie Palmer is the first one. So Yay! So, <laughs> I'm going to put my, um, I'm going to put my um, e email mm -hmm. in the chat here. So please, Jeannie, send me your email so I can give it to Cassie and you can get a book. Okay. Cool. And then I will, I will keep counting. So feel free to keep talking if you want, and then I will. Great. Actually, let me look through. I'll look through the questions here and see what else we have um, here. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, let me see. 
Okay, that was Craig's uh, question. Pinnacles, Yosemite, uh, Rosie the Riveter, Mount Um, uh, cool. <laughs> so that was raised. Uh, let's see, let's see. Lori Singer, Lori Singer, please send me an email. Awesome, congratulations, Lori. Thank you. Uh, Ron said uh, the museum, I assume he means the mining museum at the county park um, is not open yet, uh, but they are planning to open it soon. So um, that's great, um, it's, a, it's a really great place. Um, when is the mining museum open? I've never seen it open in my many years here. Um, so during normal times, I think it was only open on the weekend. So um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, check it on the weekends. Um, I know uh, for sure once it does reopen, um, they'll have good hours over the weekend. Joyce two, Joyce two, you're number three. Please send me an email. Hey, congratulations, Joyce. Um, let's see. Oh, cool. Uh, so Peg um, Carlson Bowen pointed out women's clubs did a lot of conservation in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, so that's great. Good point. And then Sarah Madden. Sarah, Sarah Madden. Madden Congratulations. Yay! It's send Terry an email and uh, include your home address on it. And uh, she will get that uh, to me and uh, I will uh, deliver them to you guys <laughs> or, or send them. Uh, I run out of t I run out of time sometimes and put them in the mail, but I'm trying to do as many That's all good. as I can. I put a lot of miles in my car, <laughs> just driving around San Jose. Uh, it's amazing how big San Jose is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, someone pointed out about the redwoods. Uh, now they're burnt. Can't wait to get back in and see what's left. Yes, it was special. It is still a special place. Uh, so, yes. Um, uh, someone pointed out, um, you're making it sound like a long trail. I think this is in regards to uh, the Anza campsite trail, uh, which is near the campground that we talked about. It's less than half a mile long. In fact, I think it's probably less than a quarter of a mile long. It is very short. Uh, but there is the second trail uh, that we mentioned, uh, which is the, um, the Arrowhead Trail at Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve. Uh, that's the interpretive site uh, for the Anza Trail, where you can learn uh, more about the, the history um, uh, of the party. Uh, that's a 4.1 mile trail uh, at Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve. Uh, but yeah, definitely the other one at the um, <laughs> near, that's very, uh, very short, very accessible. Um, it's not paved, uh, but it is very short. Can you show the website address for the hidden parks in San Jose? Um, Jeannie Palmer, um, I'm not sure I know. Oh, your website, I think. Oh, my website. Yeah. Okay, okay, my website, um, I will share that here. If I go, oh, wait, all panelists, how do I share to everyone? So yeah, my website, um, https secretsanjose.com. Uh, so I just uh, dropped my website um, down there into chat there. Um, Check the museum's website. Um, oh dear, someone put their home address there. Are you able to delete that? It's okay. It might be. A, I can. I can take it out at the end too. But oh, I, it's uh, only all panels. I think Terry and I just Terry and I can see it. Um, cool. Uh, Susan Ander Anderson Chen uh, shared that uh, Santa Clara County Parks is doing a great video series on the history of Alma Den Quicksilver on Facebook. Uh, so cool. So check um, the County Park Service. Um, uh, check the county's uh, uh, Facebook page. Uh, for that. I want to check that out myself. I <laughs> um, would love to have a guided walk of a few miles along the Anza Trail from the part mentioned. Um, that's the National Park near here. Um, yeah, definitely. The Open Space Authority, uh, like I said, get on the Open Space Authority's website, maybe by RSVPing. Um, Terry, I think, is going to add you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you want to be on the Open Space Authority's website, or you want to be on their email list um, so you can get uh, the link uh, to their monthly roundup of events uh, that they host. Um, they've been hosting a wild number of uh, virtual events every month. Uh, you can see all the events uh, archived on uh, the Open Space Authority's website, including this one. It'll be uh, there um, later this week, I guess, next week, I guess. Um, so they are planning to do, uh, Ron Horry here um, shared, um, one of our docents um, shared, we've had guided hikes on the Anza Trail in Coyote Valley before COVID. Yeah, so as soon as it's safe to do so, I know the Open Space Authority will be uh, resuming um, guided hikes of, of that trail. Um, Yvonne Zolna asked, what are the plans for the radar station at Mount Um? I heard the plans were to restore it uh, eventually to the public. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what their plans are. I don't know whether the building is unsafe right now, so you're not allowed to go anywhere near it. Um, they, they have it kind of blocked off. Um, you can't go near the building um, because it's unstable in case, in case of an earthquake. Um, they're looking to retrofit the building now uh, so that it won't fall on you while you're hiking. I don't know whether they're planning to um, improve it to the point where you'll be able to go inside. Um, that's not something I know, but um, I'll check in with Mid Peninsula I'll, I'll Open Space District. Um, they'll be able to share more info about that if anyone knows that here. Uh, okay, there, Kate um, D shared the radar tower has been sealed. It won't ever be open to the public. So. Neat. Oh. And the issue is lead paint, uh, Ian shared. Great. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so definitely. They're going to make it safe so that you can walk by it, <laughs> uh, but it's not going to be safe. Um, but um, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful preserve. Um, amazing views um, when the sky is clear. Um, so definitely get up there. Great. Um, it doesn't look like we, do we have any other final questions? Thank you so very much for doing this, Cassie. This is awesome. And yeah. uh, be sure if I called your name to, to send your um, information to my email at trogaway, T-R-O-G-O-W-A-Y at <gasps> Open Space Authority. <laughs> Not <laughs> O-R-G. <laughs> Awesome. And, uh, and, 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 and check out um, Cassie's website because like there's all kinds of good information on there. And, and then you can also um, get her contact information and be able to email her and ask her questions too. And uh, so excited for this book. It's very <laughs> exciting. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for coming. And if you'd like to see what any of our future programs are, please go to the website at www.openspaceauthority.org. And we will right. see you all later. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Cassie. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry. All right. Have a good night and a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>